Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the Institute of Risk Management's um, virtual event um, today on the 27th of August. I'm just going to put this in slideshow for you. So this morning, um, just waiting on people coming in. Um, as, as people roll in, I'll give them a one or two minutes and then we will start. Um, I know that we're a couple of minutes over. Um, just to let everyone know today, the, the event is being um, recorded. If there's anyone with any um, concerns about that, please um, either email me or put it in the chat or questions that you have as you've logged in, you will see that. Um, at the right hand side on your, your kind of panel that you have. The, today's event is about charities and mental health risk. So we have um, three presentations for you today, a little bit um, longer than the other virtual events we've, we've run. So today we go from half past nine to 11.50 with a little break at 11.05. Um, for those who have obviously seen the agenda. The presentation today will be um, Sam Waterton from UNICEF. We have Tom Elvin from um, Men That Matter. And we also have Alison Pepperell, who will be talking about the charity SIG, um, which is an IRM specific SIG. So this is the agenda today. I'm just seeing people coming in. Um, so Sam is digital specialist at UNICEF. Um, Tom has two roles today. He is the APC's program management and controls business owner, as well as a board member for Men That Matter Scotland. Um, and then, as I said, Alison Paperhill is the co-chair for the IRM SIG. The way in which the, the meeting will run today, like our previous ones, um, if you have any questions as we go through the presentations, if you could please put them in the question area or the chat area, I will keep an eye out and at oh, any point. Oh, I think someone might have their, their um, mute. Uh, maybe put everyone on mute. Oh, got someone. Asking a question, I believe. Jeanette Cadby, raised your hand. Got no idea. Never had to raise a hand before. So, um, so what we what we will do is I will if you put questions or in the chat area or in the question area as we go along through the day, um, I will. I will answer or, or I will ask those questions on your behalf and we um, just to prevent the speakers from from being interrupted and, and maybe not getting through the presentation at the end um, all speakers have left some time um, so that they can um, answer questions that has been raised. Nick, could you maybe put anything in or, or unmute or put something in the questions or chat area, please? Because I can, I don't know if I can actually talk to you through this this webcam. So if you could go into the chat area, I can maybe see why why you're you're raising your hand. So moving on, hopefully, I'm going to hand you over now to Sam, who will talk you through his presentation. So Sam, it should be coming across to you now. Yep, we can see your screen. Hi everyone, thanks Donna so much for the introduction. Um, can you see my screen okay? Sure can. Great. So I'm Sam, I work for UNICEF. UNICEF is an international development charity that works specifically to improve children's lives across the world. Uh, we're in 190 countries and, uh, and we work on a variety of areas, including health, 
Sorry, Sam. I'm just sorry. It seems that we've got people that are not on mute. Rory, are we able to mute all apart from Sam? Uh, it was just one person, and uh, I've muted them now for you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, Sam. Sorry. No worries. Um, we're we're helping improve children's lives in areas from health, education, and mental health. Uh, and a whole lot more. Um, so I'm currently based in London. I usually work in in New York, but uh, the pandemic. Um, I do have a connection to Scotland. I went to school. Um, uh, I went to secondary school in Glasgow, Highland Secondary. Um, so it's uh, a pleasure to speak to you guys. <laughs> Um, uh, today, I am UNICEF's Digital Communication Specialist, and that means that I manage UNICEF's social media channels. My focus is usually emergencies, and there is a lot of emergencies going on. At the moment, we've got Afghanistan and Haiti, and UNICEF is responding, helping children in both of those, those countries and emergencies right now, both man-made and natural disaster. Um, my other uh, side uh, of work, major work, is public health and, uh, emergencies. And um, since the COVID-19 pandemic um, has, has, has hit, um, UNICEF has been communicating on this issue um, for a long time. So let me give you uh, some context. about UNICEF's work on COVID-19. So firstly, we are delivering COVID-19 vaccines and other health supplies. Um, we have an aim of delivering around 2.2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines to countries who need it. Um, why UNICEF? Well, UNICEF actually has a major role in vaccinating children across the world um, for diseases like measles, polio, uh, tetanus, and we've actually uh, we actually vaccinate half the world's children or help vaccinate half the world's children for our programs. So um, that's why uh, we we have a major role in in the vaccine uh, rollout um to to countries who need it in addition to the world health organization and gavi we also provide covid19 guidance uh, for families and young people and we have a website with a covid19 info page um each page uh, and a web article on anything from mental health to uh, how to uh, make sure your uh, home is COVID safe um, uh, has upwards of 1 million visitors per, per month. Um, in addition to the communication side, we are, uh, we've got a major role in, in structural um, development. So we're helping build uh, and upkeep water um, systems. That means things like public water services and also hand washing facilities in schools um, and, and refugee camps as well. And um, in addition to that, we're working very closely uh, with governments. As I said, we're in, in a, over 190 different countries and territories. And that means that we work very closely with governments to advocate uh, for children's rights on um, things like uh, access to health, education, and um, safety. And, you know, I, as, as many of you will already know, this, this crisis, COVID-19 crisis, has been a major crisis for children, uh, children's rights, um, their ability to uh, get to school, um, to access uh, vaccines, uh, nutrition services to access social services um, uh, mental health services and so UNICEF is is advocating uh, with governments uh, to continue investment in all of these 
So as, as a social media manager, I have to talk about our digital supporters um, because they are a major way that we uh, do risk communication. Uh, we have over 123 million digital supporters across all of our social media channels. And um, this includes all of our country office channels as well across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. LinkedIn. We also have a big presence on China, Chinese social media channels like Weibo. And also we have Ureport, which is our um, polling and chatbot messaging system, which uh, I'll talk about a little bit more later on in this presentation. And um, as you can see on, on, the, on the little um, table on the, on the right, um, this actually represents the um, most engaged organizations talking about COVID-19 on social media in 2020. And as you can see, UNICEF and WHO, World Health Organization are up there, um, uh, you know, and, uh, and have quite a sizable lead over many of the, the big news organizations that are talking about COVID-19 and vaccines, including Fox News, CNN, and uh, BBC News. So why, why is this all important? Well, today we're talk, going to talk a little bit about uh, how UNICEF uses our social media channels um, for risk communication and community engagement and i really want to stress that community engagement side of things because we do a lot of uh, risk management um we we have a lot of listening tools uh, listening out for misinformation um but what i want to talk to you today about is our proactive way that we use uh, social media um for community engagement um, and this is the WHO's definition of risk communication, the real-time exchange of information and advice between experts, officials, and people to protect their well-being. Um, and, and, and I've highlighted there that, that exchange of information because that is really important for us, uh, UNICEF, that there's this two-way conversation as much as possible when we're talking about any public health risk, but particularly COVID-19. And this is uh, the environment uh, that we are working in. So um, I just want to take you back to 2020, right at the start of the pandemic. Um, and we were all receiving lots of different um, advice on, on COVID-19. Um, some of it was, you know, genuine information um coming from factual sources like unicef and the world health organization the nhs of course and uh, in america the cdc uh, but there was also a ton of misinformation and that is mis misinformation defined as um information that's just not quite right that has a um, element of truth potentially but also uh, has has some kind of uh, misinformation as well uh the the picture on the left is uh purportedly from unicef um, and this was shared widely on social media channels um and it starts off okay right um you know wear a mask to prevent entry but then it gets down to stay away from ice cream and eating cold foods and gargle your throat with warm and salt water and it's the same um, WhatsApp message. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of you will have received this one from Stanford, a person from Stanford University, which again um, starts off with what you might think is, you know, good trusted information, but then um, descends into uh, misinformation. So UNICEF. Uh, and other factual, like uh, other organizations that want to um, share trusted factual information, um, we're relying a lot on the strength of our social media channels to really push out 
um, uh, 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 to push out information. This is a little bit about uh, how we look at our audiences here. Our, our audiences are at the heart of what UNICEF does on social media. And um, we're looking at, uh, at at our audience and how why they why they follow UNICEF. So they follow us for five main reasons. Um, they they want to uh, know something uh, about a topic. They want to be updated about a topic. Um, they want to be moved about a topic. They want to be inspired by a topic, and they also want to be entertained. And as you can see, there's there's the functional aspect of that um the education the updating but there's also that real emotional uh, need as well to be inspired to be entertained to be moved and um for, on one side what we're, we're we 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 want to inspire people to do is to do something to like to share to comment to sign up or donate or volunteer um but on the other side what we want is 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 to give people information that um, about the issues that they, they care about or are affecting them at this particular time. And obviously COVID-19 has affected us in so many different ways uh, and our families and our children. So um, what I'll be doing in this presentation is looking at some of the pieces of content that UNICEF has used since the start of the pandemic to really engage our, our audiences, uh, both from a functional perspective and also from an emotional perspective too. So this was one of the first pieces of content that we ever put out on coronavirus. And this was right back in February, 2020. Um, we we just wanted to translate what was quite technical information on the world health organization into a social media graphic that uh, people could understand and share really easily so we're asking people to wash their hands cover their mouth while you know while sneezing and coughing um uh, avoid contact with people and seek medical care early and once we had this basis um, of of the, these key messages, uh, we were able to get a lot more creative. This particular graphic was used for Instagram, um, but uh, in Vietnam, we were able to um, turn these key messages into a viral TikTok dance, uh, for instance. And um, what I'm going to do is share this with you, so you can just see a little bit of that. So again, this is this is a really fun way um, of uh, educating uh, uh, our audiences about uh, the different ways to keep safe from coronavirus. Now, from an entertainment perspective, um, we are also looking at pr producing content that. Uh, uh, is educating but also entertaining as well and this um, piece of content was from uh, Cambodia and actually put out just a few weeks ago and uh, it's kind of gamifying um, COVID-19 uh, awareness um, through uh, getting people to follow the, the, the right um, the right ways to avoid COVID. And this is really important, right? Because when we are, when we are, um, when we get up in the morning um, and we look at uh, our phones from 
from the first hours of being awake right to the end of the day, we're, we're constantly being bar bombarded with, with information. And so what we're trying to do from a, a creative content perspective is to engage our audiences in, in the most creative ways possible uh, to keep people's attention uh, and engage them. And as you can see from um, the post on the right, uh, that you know we had a lot of audience engagement with this as people uh, played along uh, and showed what they did as well. We also want to inspire people. Um, this post um, is from one of our biggest uh, vaccine confidence campaigns um, back in February when we knew that more and more people were going to have the COVID-19 vaccine available to them. And um, what we wanted to do is to show uh, that COVID-19 vaccines were safe and effective. And what better way to do that than showing social proof um, with all the health workers um, that were in that first wave of people getting the COVID-19 vaccine. So we actually worked with over 30 UNICEF country offices and a load of influencers as well, including the UN Secretary General, uh, to post pictures of them being vaccinated and share why the vaccine was so important to them. And we got through some really incredible stories, uh, over 10 million engagements um, in countries across the world. Um, and one of my favorites really was uh, this uh, little black and white photo um, on the top left, which was from a doctor in, in Brazil. She shared a picture of her mother who um, was recovering from polio. And the next photo that she shared was a picture of her receiving her COVID-19 vaccine and that went viral in BBC, uh, sorry, in, in, in Brazil and was actually picked up by the BBC. Um, and it's a really great example of how social media um, can really feed into um, uh, media. Uh, and uh, she was able to talk about um, why, why, why the COVID-19 vaccine was so important to her and why others should, should get that too. So on the functional side, uh, we're looking at ways to update our, um, our, our audiences. And um, there's no better way to do this uh, than our U-Report um, chatbot. So back in February, um, when a load of misinformation and information was coursing through the web, uh, we built a COVID-19 chatbot very quickly um, uh, to respond. Uh, and this chatbot um, basically provided people with information um, on COVID-19 symptoms, um, how it spread and how people could protect themselves. But it also allowed people to um, submit rumors uh, that they'd heard uh, and also ask for additional information. Now, this was really important because to date, um, a lot of the communication, a lot of the misinformation that we've been seeing um, had actually been spread through WhatsApp. And U-Report was a way of, of entering these dark spaces, really, um, with, with trusted verified information um, from UNICEF and the WHO, um, and in particularly reaching uh, young people. And uh, in the first six months of the, the, the chatbot launching, um, over 20 million people um, in countries across the world had accessed uh, COVID-19 information about, about, um, from this chatbot. Now, why, why was this so important? Well, we find from UNICEF, U Report research that 70% of U Reporters um, actually share 
the information that they get through the chatbot with their friends and family. Um, so it's a really great way not just to reach you reporters, but also uh, the people around them as well. So you report wasn't just a chatbot um, for COVID-19. It was actually a way of pulling um, our audiences on their uh, awareness of COVID-19 uh, and symptoms. This actually became a really powerful way of of working with governments. This data became a really powerful way of working with governments to um, uh, really pinpoint people's uh, knowledge and, and help develop communication um, around that uh, and also policies. So this is one of my favorites from UNICEF Jamaica. Um, and uh, it's a great example of how you report uh, the flexibility of your report is that it can be translated into many different languages um, and also it talks in the way that uh, you would talk um, in in that country uh, so uh, in this particular case um, the main finding from one of their early polls on COVID-19 was was that people needed more information on and how the virus was spread and so that informed government and unicef uh, communications on on the outbreak as well and it's a really good example of how um when we're doing risk communication uh this community engagement aspect this exchange of information is so important because it allows um everyone to share data uh, and uh, and share information as well. So the last um, slide which I'm going to um, share with you is, is, is our audiences need to, to be moved. And um, when, when the outbreak first started, we actually knew that um, one of UNICEF's biggest roles um, could be amplifying the voices of children and young people that had been affected by the pandemic in, in various different ways. Um, not only did, you know, did we need to share their stories, um, but we also knew that they had solutions as well um, on ways, innovative ways to, um, to, to deal with the pandemic. Uh, we actually to date have about um, 50 to 70 uh, COVID-19 diaries from around the world uh, and each of them focus on a child doing different things uh, like making their own marks or um, what they're doing uh, to protect their mental health during lockdown. And this um, video is one of our most watched videos in this series. It's had over 100 million views um, so far. And um, I just hope that you'll be able to hear it uh, <laughs> and that it buffers OK. Um, so please bear with me. And please, Donna, jump in if uh, it just becomes too much. Thank you. 
So um, those are the five uh, different audiences, uh, audience uh, emotions uh, uh, that we really uh, trying to target um, in our risk communication and community engagement. Um, I really hope that uh, coronavirus did not come to MENA, uh, MENA's refugee camp um, either. So um, that's the end of my presentation. And um, yeah, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. I think um, you, you're definitely right. I watching that, I'm, I'm pretty sure not just only myself, but everyone. The, the kind of no updated move, inspired, entertained was definitely something that that I could feel the emotions of of watching Mina's journey. Um, in the chat and the questions. We don't have any chats or questions at the moment, which is quite um, quite unusual. So I'm just going to give people um, a little minute, just in case there's anyone that does have anything that they would like to put through. I know sometimes it can be quite um, difficult to find everything <laughs> on on webinars, um, but without a doubt, I think um, just understanding how you know social media. Um, you know, I, I think before talking to you, Sam, I didn't really know what a chatbot was. I didn't know that's what they were called. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think uh, the, for risk managers and, and the way we move forward and how we can we can um, engage people more and communicate with people more, this is something that is, is really important. So the tips today and, and seeing how UNICEF do it. And 10, 10 million views, right? My son's trying to get a TikTok view of 100. <laughs> so I know how hard that can be. <laughs> so. Um, so yes, yeah, so thank you very much for sharing that. I think what we'll do is we'll move on to Tom, and then if we get any questions, um, as people maybe um, think about it a bit more, we can ask you questions at the end. If you're okay with that, Sam, yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Donna. Yeah. No. Oh, oh, I think I might have a question. Two seconds. Yep. So, um, what challenge and um, what do you see as the coming challenges for the charity se sector? That's for you, Sam. Oh, that's a big one. Um, from a um, international development um, charity perspective, uh, I think one of the major challenges um, for UNICEF um, is uh, in the emergency field. Um, 50% of UNICEF's funds actually go to helping children in emergencies. Um, that is like uh, conflicts and also natural disasters as well. So um, as the, the, the world is, does, you know, it seems like the, there should have been a pause on hostilities, you know, um, going, going forward. Um, through this 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 pandemic and um, but there just is no pause there has not been a pause um for for uh, families in syria afghanistan yemen um uh, ethiopia as well 
so it is a it's 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 a it's a it's a hard world out there, um, and it's also not being made any better by climate change as well. Uh, and uh, you, again, you'll you'll see families uh, being affected more and more by extreme weather as well. So that is certainly one of the major concerns for UNICEF um, in in the coming years is 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 both those um, emergencies that that we have control over uh, and also those emergencies that we we don't um, so yeah that's that's going to be a major major um, focus area for UNICEF it has been for since our inception over 75 years ago now for the international for, for the charity sector in general um, it, it, I think that a major issue um, is, 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 is funds. Uh, it always will be. Um, there, there's always um, so much more that charities in general can do um, or need to do, um, but without the funds, um, they, they can't. And so I think that that is, is a major challenge, but also um, from a from we know that people have been incredibly generous um throughout the pandemic and particularly from unicef side we've seen um people being even more generous um than than years before because uh, uh, i think there's a general solidarity and understanding um now um you know that with a pandemic that can affect everyone uh, that we're all in this together um, and uh, we all need to help each other out on, on, on this. Um, so I definitely think in terms of challenges, the opportunities here is, is this, this, this global solidarity, this, this kindness um, is really, really a, a light at the end of the tunnel for all of us. Thank you. Um, we've got another couple. Um, Hi Sam, thanks for great presentation. Do you have risk professionals working with you at UNICEF or are you trained to consider risk management as part of delivering your day-to-day -day responsibilities? Yes, so we we do have um, risk professionals working uh, with us um, but in the social media team in particular we we are trained um, on on risk management, so um, particularly risk management and community engagement. I'd love to go more into it, um, but it's a specific um, kind of communication, um, which is really uh, relevant for public health emergencies. And so, when we're looking at uh, risk management, we're we're looking at um, firstly how to um, uh, mitigate risk. Um, how to listen out for risk uh, uh, and also how to work with our, our target audiences on on that particular risk um, uh, looking at the influences that can help us communicate that risk um, as well and and then of course we have a huge evaluation um, element of all of this as well so you know i know that there's a, a lot of similarities in the way that um, you guys would look at risk and also how we would look at risk from a you know a social media perspective but on our on our channels um, for UNICEF we are constantly looking out for um, for reputational risk and misinformation as well um, through a number of listening tools um, and uh, we have a community manager as well who will be uh, responding uh, talking uh, to our audiences as well um so yeah we we have a huge um interest in risk communication from a uh, unicef's perspective and also <laughs> the um donna might also have a nice story for you but um we also have a uh, there is a un body um called the un um disaster risk um it's, it's basically uh, on disaster risk and um they they focus particularly on um 
uh, climate climate risk, um, but in, in all, all types of um, uh, risks as well. So uh, they're worth looking at um, if you're interested in that um, from a sort of UN perspective. Thanks, Sam. Um, one last question. How robust is electronic information in emergencies and war torn regions? So um, it depends. It depends on what country you're in, but most people um, around the world have a mobile phone. They have access to social media, um, uh, even in an emergency. So uh, we, yeah, it's still a major um, uh, aspect of our our work is is through through um, through social media and through through you report. So I'll just give you an example of um, Afghanistan uh, at the moment um, when the Taliban um, moved in. Um, there was a lot of chaos and confusion. Um, uh, UNICEF. Is, is on the ground. It has a big office there, and we have um, a lot of programs, we're supporting a lot of programs, um, particularly for people displaced um, by conflict. Um, there's about 10 million children uh, that uh, need humanitarian assistance there at the moment. And um, UNICEF has a U report um, presence there. And is able to send out. Um, it, it sent out within days of uh, the regime change um, a, a message to all of its EU reporters asking um, what they needed. And that that the answers that we got back uh, will be crucial in the in the next few weeks and, and months in um, providing life saving. Uh, humanitarian assistance, and um, this is all uh, through 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 mobile phones. Um, in terms of uh, other digital um, communication, we also have a website called the Internet of Good Things, and this is a very simple website um, that is free to use, um, even on a basic mobile phone. And when I say basic, I'm talking even more basic than a Nokia 3210, um, if some of you remember those. And um, we work with uh, um, big um, cell companies uh, to provide that information for free. Uh, sorry, provide that data, that that tiny amount of data for free. Um, so uh, we have a number of, of, of topics, including COVID-19, but also things on nutrition for children, um, breastfeeding, um, uh, and, and that kind of thing. So from a from a, a like electronic perspective, we have social media, we have U Report, and we also have the Internet of Good Things, which is you know a more basic um, uh, website for people. And then um, we have a very big presence, as I said. A, a, um, on the ground. So for people that are the hardest to reach that have no access to um, mobile phone, um, we have uh, a big team of community volunteers that also um, go out into the local community and talk to people about various risks affecting them. Um, you know, uh, you know, it could be on COVID-19, but uh, you know, I it was in 2019. I was in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo during the Ebola response, and I saw firsthand how um, community volunteers played a crucial role in reaching really tiny villages and towns uh, to talk to people about how to pre to prevent Ebola. Um, and then. Sorry to go on about this, but it, I I just love talking about this. Um, the other way that uh, UNICEF uh, uh, and other international organisations reach people, the hardest to reach people with no access to um, uh, um, mobiles or internet is through radio. Radio is one of the biggest 
um, and best and most reliable forms of reaching large amounts of people in addition to TV. Um, but radio really reaches um, uh, the most people out of all communications. And uh, that's why UNICEF has partnerships um, with a ton of, um, of, of radio stations in, in nearly every country that we work with uh, to, to spread information uh, during emergencies. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for that. I, um, I didn't, I didn't know that about radio being, being so high up there. So that I learned something today. Um. So thank you. I'm going to move on now to Tom. If there anything else comes through, I'll ask questions at, at the end of Tom's. But um, we've we've come to the end of your section. So thank you so much for your time today and and uh, sharing your, your um extensive knowledge on UNICEF and how we can, how we can um take some tips. Um, from how you do social media, etc., and take that into our workplaces. Thank you so much, Donna, and thanks so much for every, everyone's questions. No problem, thank you. Okay, so Tom, I am just going to change to yourself. Let's see how you go. Yep, we have your presentation up. That's it. Oh. Um. Okay. Try it once more, Donna, if that's okay. Yep. Yeah, just need to put it on probably slideshow. For the bottom. Yep, no bother. And that's your. Yep. You're ready. All right. Can everyone see that? Um. Just. A, I think they're just a tiny bit of the way, Tom. Yep, that's us. Okay. Oh, we can see your Perfect. notes, Tom. Tom, we can see it as a right. note. So it should be off, Donna. Um, are you using two screens? No. No. Um, Is that any better? Um, no, we can still see it. And um, you maybe maybe want to um, oh, um, and do it like you were doing the first time because what we can see is you know how like the way you like present our so display settings. I don't know if that maybe helps at the top. Okay, so I'm just going to show screen. Yeah, so you're seeing like a kind of this slide and the next slide coming. Right, okay, so I don't know why. Give me seconds. Can you see me now, Donna? Um no, it's not it's not changed. Um give me a second. Apologies for the technical hitch. <laughs> I always wonder how to get that to work. <laughs> you see, we were getting it to work. Right. So you can still, so I'm just going to end this, right? Okay. And can you still see my screen? I can just see you, not the screen. That's probably a bad thing, definitely, then, if you can just see me. Full screen. Right. And I'm not sure. See, um, so we can see it like a presentation just now, but what we can see is, you know, how your car, what you've got paste, then you've got like new slide, we use slide, so we can see it. That's it. That's it. We're done. Okay. That was definitely my fault. Um, so apologies, everybody. Um, so as if I wasn't nervous enough, I have had technical glitches. I am following on from UNICEF's digital specialist. So this will probably be the most bland presentation you've ever seen in your life. So thanks very much for that, Sam. Um, Donna, uh, thanks very much for, for asking me to, to come here today and, and present. It's very much appreciated. Uh, so a brief intro. Um, as Donna said, um, Tom Elvin, uh, founder of Alliance Project Controls Limited. 
and very recently appointed the chair of Men Matter Scotland, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer support network based in Glasgow um, to prevent suicide and improve uh, mental health. So a little bit about me, which will become um, relevant, I hope. Uh, I am happily married with children, uh, born and brought up in Glasgow, serving my apprenticeship in Yarrow Shipbuilders in the River Clyde. I've worked across most industry sectors. I've held many, many different roles, and I have suffered from mental health. What I would say today very clearly is that I am not a mental health professional, but I have uh, lived experience. Uh, and I think that nowadays, given where we are, how things are viewed, I think it's very, very important to have people understand that real people are open and how they have suffered from mental health. This isn't quite my CV, but if anybody asks if I've ever had any issues, I'll be quite open and honest and tell them that I have. I think that's a start. I think if people see me, who is viewed as a relative success, I would guess, that is open and honest and saying that they have suffered from, from these issues, if it helps one more person, become open and honest in their suffering, then I think it would be very, very valuable. The only really formal part um, about this presentation is the next two slides, and I just want to make it um, pretty clear about what mental health actually is. So, for those of you that don't know, mental health is defined by the World Health Organization as a state of mental and physiological and um, psychological well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential and can cope with the normal stresses of life and work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to their own community. Well-being is defined as being the U by the UK Department of Health as feeling good and functioning well and comprises everyone's experience of their life and a comparison of life circumstances with social norms and values, well-being can be both subjective and objective. The next thing I would like to try and show is that mental well-being is different. So mental well-being uh, is defined by mind, describes a dynamic mental state. An individual with good mental uh, well-being is able to and all these things underneath are what we use to define mental well-being. The reason, <coughs> excuse me, the reason why I'm differentiating is that there are lots of um, companies that I have worked with and I've worked for that don't really distinguish between mental health and well-being. They can have a kind of mental health program. They can have a well-being program. But it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a mental health strategy in place. And I want to try and make sure that people, as many people as possible, understand that and as many people as possible know that. It's a, it's a fact that a lot more organisations that myself and Donna, for example, work with are now trying to, to introduce wellness, well-being, mental health as part of their normal day-to-day uh, -day working which I see is incredibly, incredibly positive. But I just want all of you to try and understand that there is a difference between well-being and mental well-being. And hopefully, um, that's been made clear uh, in the last few slides. Next thing, what does mental health in the workplace look like? <clears throat> I actually struggled to, to, to try and determine and depict what mental health looked like. I've tried to depict what it looks like for me. So for me, the picture on the left is how my mind works, how my mind sometimes gets overrun, how my mind sometimes doesn't quite compute properly. And on the right hand side is a is a reason or a number of reasons why my mind acts as it does. Now I don't doubt for one second <clears throat> that I'm the only person that feels like this. But given that today I've been given the opportunity to come and speak to all of you, I wanted to try and make it clear how it made how it made me feel. I had a, a Eureka moment probably four or five years ago 
when I was in a, a mental health um, training course and for the first time was referred by the course instructor as mental health and not mental illness. That for me changed the focus and the way that I looked at it. Mental illness for me was a was a negative, was a stigma that was perhaps attached to things. Mental health is something that made me look at it completely different. Mental health is something that I thought, I can work on this, I can make this better, I can become more healthy as opposed to more ill. And I think it became something that, that, that drove me in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, and culminating just now in being involved in the third sector with Men Matter Scotland to try and help other people see it as I do and try and make sure that they know that it is the, the old adage, it is not just them. So for me, that's what mental health looks like. I would be very interested to understand <clears throat> from any of you what it looks like to you, what it feels like to you, uh, and I'm sure that uh, if I have my, my contact details shared after the session this morning, I would be more than willing to try and understand what it looks like to yourselves. For me, I spoke earlier on about my background. Uh, I, I, come, I come from Glasgow, as you can probably tell with these dulcet tones. I worked in the shipyards in Glasgow, and as you can probably imagine, the the opportunity to show your emotion to try and tell these guys that you have a weakness wasn't an opportunity that was taken very often it was always very difficult to show anything other than a really stern strong outlook because you didn't want to be considered weak you didn't want to be considered different so like many other people back then and indeed still now i put a mask on I put a mask on in my work, I put a mask on when I played sport, I put a mask on when I went out with my friends, because we are typically told, and it's programmed into us, not to show that weakness. This mask can take many different forms. In the workplace for me, it was perhaps a suit and a tie. It was being... Um, strong and clear in my communication with my teams, with my colleagues. If I was out with uh, some of my friends, it was perhaps being overly loud, overly jovial, trying to deflect any possible um, thought of me showing a weakness, of them thinking that I had any sort of um, chink in my armour. So that mask is something that it's taken me a long, long time to actually understand, but to actually remove. Now I am comfortable enough to, to do what I'm doing today, to share with yourselves what it makes me feel like, what it makes me act like, how I try and improve, how I try and change. And, and as I said, I want to make it okay not to be okay. And the more I can do this by speaking openly and honestly, the more people hopefully we can help. How big is the issue? Right? For me, um, when I started looking into to, to mental health, particularly for today and how big it is in the workplace, predominantly for the charity work I do, we look at it in, uh, in life in general. But when I looked at it for the general workplace, it was, it was incredible how much it had an impact. So, as you can see in the slide, at any one time, one in six employees within a workplace will be struggling with their mental health. That is normally one in four in the general population, but one in six in the workplace is still an incredibly high number for me. And we think about how many people are in fact working. There are a lot of people out there who are suffering or who have suffered or indeed who will suffer through mental health. I think we have to do something to try and improve that. Ninety-one percent of UK workers feel that their career prospects would be curtailed if they disclosed a mental illness. I had uh, an ex-colleague contact me earlier this year when they found out that I was involved in a mental health charity. They spoke to me quite candidly 
about an incident that happened in 2012 where they came into the office and they were quite clearly not themselves and I asked if they were okay and they told me that they were. She subsequently told me that when she found out I was working for a mental health charity, she wished that she had told me all the years ago because for the next three, four, five years, she struggled really, really badly trying to deal with it, trying to hide with it, uh, trying to hide it, sorry, and was also acutely aware that if she did tell her boss, who was me or one of her other bosses, that she thought that her career would be impacted or curtailed, her pension perhaps would be impacted. And these are things that I think are a really sad indictment of how we currently view mental health and wellbeing in the workplace. The next stat baffled me, sorry, baffled me because I had no idea how much of an impact it would have to the UK economy per annum. And this isn't just purely uh, in the workplace, this is uh, across all factors of life. But when we talk about 41.8 billion and 77 billions a year in terms of lost productivity, in terms of welfare benefits, in terms of people taking sick time, it is something that if we invested a fraction of that money, uh, as I will come on to later, then I think the benefits would be felt by all areas of society. 89% of the mental health issues, sorry, with mental health issues say that it impacts their working lives. That's an incredibly high stat. And for me, a lot of that is due to people still not truly really understanding that they can share, that they can talk, that they can help. A lot of the companies, as I said, that we are currently working with have been far, far, far more proactive in recent years in terms of helping people making services available. So we are hoping that as the years progress, these people find less and less impact, not just in their working life, but in their daily lives also. And this is something that I found particularly difficult to deal with. 37% of people who have taken time off work with stress tell their employees that it was something completely different that caused that absence. For me, that's really sad. We can't actually be open and honest. And I think that if we can't be open and honest and we can't make it okay for people to chat about it, these numbers are only going to go up. The stigma that is attached to it is still very, very strong. And the risks associated with that in the workplace are considerable also. Now, far be it from me to talk to, to this very well-informed and learned group about risks, but what I have tried to do is capture what some of the risks in the workplace actually are. Losing staff, both in terms of being ill, but also through feeling disaffected. They, they don't perhaps feel engaged, they don't perhaps feel supported. So there's a danger that our teams, our businesses, our workplaces will lose staff. We will definitely lose productivity. I think that has um, been explained in previous slides. But if people don't feel the best, if people don't feel engaged, then they're not going to work as hard because perhaps they don't enjoy what they're doing and they also don't feel up there. The other risk is, is losing faith. I think there's companies now who definitely don't want to be that company who don't appear to be grasping and looking to help mental health. I think that there are companies that, that I have personally worked with and worked for during COVID who have absolutely behaved incorrectly with regards how you deal with people's uh, mental health and well-being. And I think that that is another risk. If companies don't change, they're going to lose face and ultimately people will not want to go and work there. One of the other risks, and, and Sam mentioned at quite great length, um, COVID and some of the impact it's had on the UNICEF stuff. For me, coming out of COVID is a huge risk. I run a business. I also go into client organisations and run their teams. I have seen, as we come out or are looking to come out of COVID, I have seen three very, very different groups when it comes to, to how, how we want to exit the COVID restrictions and lockdowns. There are a group of people who are really keen, in fact, some are desperate to get back into how they lived and worked normally. So they're already 
back into the workplace, they want to go back into the office, they want to go to their friends, they want to go to sporting events. So that's what I would say is one group. There's a second group who will accept that when their workplace reopens, they will go, they will take the appropriate measures, but they will reintegrate back into society as perhaps they once were. The other group for me, and this is where I think the risk is, is the group who have felt isolated, who continue to feel isolated, who do not want to re-engage for a variety of different reasons. One, they don't feel capable because they've been working from home and isolated for the last 18 months. They're really worried that they've lost the skills um, to go and effectively be part of an integrated team. It could, in fact, be their mental health that they feeling really, really low. They don't know how to give themselves that figurative shake to get themselves back into things. And there's also the group of people who are still really, really, really concerned about COVID. So for me, workplaces understanding that, and this is obviously workplaces we're talking about today, but in general life, I would ask that if you've got a large group of friends and some of them appear to be disassociated, disaffected, and don't want to come out of the pub. I don't want to go to the football. I don't want to go to a nightclub, for example. It's maybe worthwhile just checking and making sure that they're okay. Because it won't, it won't be the case in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of instances that they just don't want to go. They probably just don't know how to go, how to break that cycle, how to break that routine. So in terms of, of the risks, I would say that there are, there are a number there that, that I mentioned. I'm sure there are many, many more, but as you can imagine, with limited time today, I wanted to try and get as many of the, the, the kind of large salient points as I can uh, over to you. In terms of opportunities, we are at a point where mental health is being spoken about more than it ever has. It's being um, promoted is perhaps the wrong word, but but communicated in a different way now that we are trying to get as many people as we can fully conversant, fully aware and fully understanding that there are people who are in amongst every single one of us who are perhaps suffering slightly. They are suffering for a number of different reasons and a number of different ways and it manifests itself in a number of different ways. So the opportunities that I see at this point in time is for companies to be different to engage in a different way, to communicate in a different way, to support people in a different way, and to encourage people to talk about it. In terms of being bold, this is a time when we have a tremendous opportunity coming out of COVID and what the world's went through, to let as many people understand the different natures of mental health and well-being that we have as, as a population, as a workforce, as a group of friends, as a team of football players, whatever it may be. I think it's a time when, if we are bold, we can take a really, really big step forward on the understanding and the acceptance of mental health and well-being. And for me, if you have mental health and well-being issues, be brave. Don't be ashamed of them. Don't uh, don't hide it, uh, and I'm and I'm conscious that uh, it's a scary thought for some of us. But what I would say is, if you yourself have mental health issues, mental health concerns, be brave. If you've got a group of friends, hopefully they'll be brave and support you. And for me, the organisation that I am currently involved with, outside of my, my professional life at Men Matter Scotland, that's what we try and do. We try to make sure that we. We, from the very highest tower, shout about how things can, in fact, be okay, which takes me on to my next point. How can we improve it? So let's try, work together, and remove the stigma. It's okay not to be okay. We're different. There is more in the world that unites us than will ever divide us. Mental health does not define somebody. It doesn't make them exactly what they are. It's just something about what they have become. So for me, if mental health is part of what you are, that's okay. It's okay not to be okay. I think if we look around us and we, we walk 
um, and and work if we work in our if we work in our city centres or wherever we're going to be, we will be surrounded by more people than we can ever imagine who struggle. So for me, it's okay not to be okay, and I would ask that message to be to be taken into consideration, to be shared, and to be repeated. Increased awareness. The stuff that, that I'm trying to do here, thanks to the, the invite from Donna and yourselves, is to try and increase awareness. I think the more we increase awareness, the more we can um, increase acceptance. And I think for me, it's incredibly important that we do that. For me, prevention is better than cure. We spend, as a, as a charity organisation, as the professional um, NHS services, we spend far too much of our time trying to cure people. When people have poor mental health or poor mental wellbeing, we try and cure them. Figuratively speaking, I would like to think that instead of, peeling, instead of pulling people out of the river, we're actually going upstream and trying to understand what's making the people jump in. So prevention for me is better than cure. Training, awareness, communication, a, a, a startling fact from Deloitte that I read only this week is that there's clear evidence that, that businesses, when they do invest in mental health, as I said, particularly preventative measures, they won't only reduce the impact to the mental health, but they'll see a considerable return on their, their investment. Studies have shown that for every pound invested in the preventative measures of mental health, they've seen it return um, fivefold in terms of productivity, staff engagement, how happy people are, retention. Now, for me, that isn't something that is just by accident. That's something that that I've seen work and is in fact a, 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 a proven fact in what we do. If we're investing money, if we're investing time, if we're trying to remove the stigma, who does it actually benefit? Everybody benefits every single person. I have seen people at their lowest ebb who have been given a helping hand, who have been helped up, who have been assisted, who have been supported, who have been communicated with. And it doesn't only help them, it helps the whole entire team, it helps the whole entire organisation, it helps the friend circle. Everybody who can help improve mental health will benefit. So I think it's very, very important to take that as a as a little point of note. If you see somebody struggling, as I made the mistake with the colleague back in 2012, I asked him, are you okay? And he said, yes. We now follow that up with, are you really okay? Are you really okay? And the amount of times that people answer, people's answer changes from the first time you ask them to the second time you ask them is incredibly high. So for me, if we can help as many people as we can, everybody benefits. And, and I don't think that can be a message that we can express too lightly. The other thing that I will say as a closing request from me is that we don't always know what people are going through. We don't always know the struggles that people are, that are having. So for me, if you can be one thing every single day, be nice. It really isn't that difficult. And what I would say is you probably have no idea how much a little bit of nice behaviour, a nice word, a nice action, how much impact it can have on somebody who is truly, truly struggling. So as I said, closing request from me is, is be nice. Doesn't it take much? Doesn't it cost anything? That kind of finishes what I, I have to speak to you about. Um, Donna has assured me that if there is a Q&A, there will be no difficult questions. What I also want to say is, is that in a forum such as this, I'll answer as many questions as I possibly can. If I don't have the answer, I'll find you the answer. But what I would also say is that anybody who you know is welcome to, to contact me in terms of any professional matters. That's fine. But if anybody wants to try and contact me and find out 
how we at Myanmar Scotland, how I can come and speak to your relative um, organisations and try and increase awareness, I'd be happy to do it. What I would also say is, if anybody wants to speak to me about any more personal matters, please feel free to get in touch. Anything that is discussed, asked, or talked about would be confidential. Or if you have anybody who you think may be struggling, please put them in touch with me as well. I would be more than delighted to help in any way I possibly can. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. I think that Thanks, was um, that was um, very interesting in terms of um, just the magnitude of of the impact in terms of like the one in six, seventy seven billion. I mean, in terms of um, not trying to put money to people's health, but you know, times are tight, um, and there's a lot of learning for organisations. I think in that um, in terms of productivity, performance, having people healthy and, and happy at work. So I think um, as risk managers and, and for those that are maybe in construction areas and maybe not in the mental health and charities, but crossing that over to other places is that the, these um, individuals are all individuals that help organisations do what they have to do. And if they can't do that effectively, then that really is a risk to the business, yeah, which is something that risk managers would be would be looking at and strategy. So um thank you so much for your insight and and your offering um for anyone as risk managers. I'm I'm pretty sure we see a lot of the the um maybe um uh, kind of root causes or or we get trigger points of where things might be starting to to show so early warning signs. So Thank you so much for that. Um, we don't have questions in chat um, or in anything in the chats because I think it's something that probably people, as you say, will resonate with and they'll probably be digesting. Um, and you may you may get some questions and and uh, anything following the following the, the presentation. So I'm going to what what we did plan for was to. Um, we just got someone that has actually come up and said thank you. It was a very inspiring. Um, oh, sorry, great presentation. Advice for listeners. Thanks, um, Tom. Great presentation. And um, do you think organ? So this is a question. Do you think organisations are doing enough to walk the talk when it comes to managing the mental health of their staff? In simple terms, no. Nowhere near it. I think there are people who put in wellbeing strategies and they, they send out some emails and they perhaps, for want of a better phrase, cover their own behinds. I think there's a lot more that can be done. I think it's still seen as a as a separate business team, if you like, where in essence it absolutely covers everything that we do. So I would like to see them do a lot more. I would like to see people live the beliefs that they speak about. Um, but I would say that in the last three or four years, a lot of the clients that, that I've worked with, and certainly the one that you work with currently, Donna, um, Stantec, have made a huge difference in how they communicate, help and engage. I would just like to see a lot more other big companies doing the same. And another question, um, any advice for listeners when someone opens up regarding their mental health? So if somebody opens up um, to their mental health for me, the one thing that I do is listen, right? It's really easy um, when somebody opens up to you to try and fix all the problems and try and, uh, it's quite, depending on the gravity of the situation, it can be quite upsetting. I would say that the first thing that you do is listen, because quite often, the fact that the person's opened up and started speaking is probably the biggest, boldest, bravest move that they've done to improve their mental health. So in the first instance, I would say, listen, if after they have downloaded, I would say that you try and ascertain yourself initially how serious the issue is, and at that point, determine 
what the next course action is, whether it be to to contact somebody um, like me in Scotland, or if it's the professional services, or I would say in the most extreme cases, do not be in any way, shape, or form worried about the police. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so hopefully, I think I've, I, unfortunately, I didn't see the questions were hiding, so you did have some few questions and just a, a um, general thank you so much for being open and candid and a really inspiring presentation. That was a feedback, Tom. Um, so what, what I'm thinking about doing just now is we did have a comfort break and we're running a wee bit early, just a, maybe 10 minutes early. Um, what I would suggest is we we go on a comfort break for 10 minutes. Um, so maybe back here about 11. If we could be back for 11, I think that would be great. And we will hand over to Alison uh, Pepperhill. So if what what to do, I think you can, as audiences, you can log out or you can keep it um, keep it running with your um, we can't see anything for for us. Um, Tom um, and Alison, etc. If we just turn off our webcams and our our, our, um, our, our speaker, then we will turn on when we come back. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. See you all ten.
Hi, Alison. Can you hear you, Alison? People can hear you. People can see you. I still can't hear you. Can you hear me? There should be like a little microphone. Can um can you see the chat? Would you like to write in the chat? I'm muting you. Oh. Oh. It may have been him. Um, where are you? I'm wondering if that's what um I can't even see you. Oh wait there. Sorry, sorry. Top top now? I think you've unmuted me now. Can you so hear me? I sure can. It must have been um, Rory. Rory must have done it this morning. Ah, okay. Can I try sharing my full screen to see if it works? Of course you can. Two seconds, just to hi apologies, there's a little weight down here. Um, what will be access to the recording and the slides? <laughs> um, of course. I'm glad you're in control. I'm useless <laughs> with tech, so they will be posted. Just so that I can see um see what right, okay, so let me transfer it to yourself today. Um Mm -hmm. Right, Alison. You back? Oh, I can see you with me. Sorry, I can see you. I can see your inbox, not your presentation. Uh, right. So, how do I point it to? Screen, hang on, I've got it. Screen two. Can you see the presentation? Not yet. Oh, yep. Can now. Can now, yep. Great. And just needs to go into slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's kind of weird because when we did it before, I could see it differently but uh doesn't matter um all right i'm hitting from beginning can you see it properly now yes that's it yes. okay, okay. So i'm just going to start because everyone should be back by now um in terms of our, our kind of comfort break so hopefully everyone's now back so just introducing you to alison Pepperell that you can see on the screen. Um, Alison is the co-chair for the charity SIG, so I'm going to hand over the reins to you, Alison, um, for the next 30 or so minutes. Um, so I will come off and if there's anything, I'll, I'll obviously pop in. As I said, I'll take the, the questions and, and um, ask at the end. Okay. 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 So uh, good morning, everyone. I'm here as co-chair of the Charity Special Interest Group, or SIG as we call it, of the IRM, along with my co-chair, Paula Carlson-Brown of the University of Glasgow. Um, in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Charity SIG 
uh, what it is, what it does, go into a bit of detail about the latest set of our publications, which are around emerging risk, as it says. Um, mention something called Resilience Reimagined, which isn't our publication, sadly, um, but it's one that I'd strongly recommend as an important read to anyone involved in risk uh, and take the questions at the end. Um, so I was asked to kind of showcase the charity's SIG. Um, so just as background, we're a team of eight people on the SIG committee. Uh, we organise events, we issue publications, and we act as a hub for members with questions um, and try and put people in touch with their peers. Uh, it's a very well-established SIG, started in about 2005, um, and we focus on providing practical guidance for charities about managing risk, as well as providing opportunities to share knowledge, tips, best practice, um, amongst sector professionals. Our overall aim is to increase the sector's knowledge of risk management best practice, explore practical solutions, and provide a forum where risk professionals can meet, virtually in recent times and face-to-face -face before that. We've been holding roughly an event per month online at the moment, um, and before the pan pandemic, we did more like three or four formal half-day seminar sessions on a face-to-face -face basis. These were usually held in London, pretty much exclusively, um, and actually doing webinars enables us to um, contact or have contact with more and different people, um, which is great. Um, the webinars we've been done have been a mix up of um, member catch ups, thought leadership events on things like risk and resilience, how to cope with COVID-19 as a charity. Um, and it has been a really positive experience, despite at the start it being um, a bit of a um, head scratcher as to how we were going to adjust. Uh, the final thing I'll mention is we do have a closed LinkedIn group, um, which you can apply to join and I'll definitely let you in, assuming you, you work for a charity or with charities. Um, but if I'm honest, it's difficult to get traction there and is something we want to get working better going forward. So that kind of gives you a, a bit of background. Um, on the publication side in particular, on the website, there are, oof, I'm going to say about 12 different publications you can get your hands on, um, which uh, we started looking at publications back in 2015 um, with, get, with the Getting Started Guide and updated these in 2018 when ISO 31000 was updated. Um, getting Started um, and Getting Better publications have a kind of large scale, full blown guidance document, but also a mini three fold summary document, um, which feedback tells us has gone down really well with boards. Um, getting started, you won't be surprised to hear, is all about getting started with risk management, um, setting a risk management policy, thinking about how to structure it within an organisation, and then how to implement risk management within a charity. Getting better is more of a maturity framework. So once you've got started and you're making progress and maturing well, there's a framework you can have a look at to see where you are and where you want to be. And we're, we're always at pains to say, you may not want to be an expert. You may be perfectly happy just being you know, your average uh, charity uh, handling risk. In 2017, we were asked to tackle risk appetite because a lot of our members, well, a fair number, were struggling to articulate risk appetite. Um, and again, there's a flyer, a guide, and also a presentation on the webpage. Um, in 2018, we added a stakeholder mapping tool guide uh, following a really interesting half day session where we picked lots of SIG members' brains, committed it to a flip chart, and then converted it into a guide. Um, it 
The guide explains what stakers are, stakeholders are, who they could be, plus how you might want to interact with different groups differently. And the major topic for 2018 was risk and regulation or risk governance. Um, so how you could structure risk governance within different sized organisations so that you tackled risk effectively. In this guide, there's an appendix that breaks down potential um, structures by a large charity, a medium sized charity and smaller sized organisations. So we very much try and keep the guidance practical, not theoretical and available to all different sizes of charities. Um, we have that in mind when we designed the guidance. These are the latest set of publications that we've been issuing during 2021 around emerging risks, because again, it came back to the SIG committee that charities were hearing a lot of noise about emerging risks, but didn't have a lot of documentation to go to to say, how could we tackle it? And again, we don't see our publication as the be all and end all, we simply see it as a guide. Um, probably worthwhile explaining how the guides are created. Um, we generally put a call out through the IRM, through the SIG members um, who, who we deal with um, to say, okay, we're gonna form a working group to look at, in this case, emerging risk. Um, so are you interested in joining and being part of it? Um, people then step up and uh, what we do from there is we make sure that those who contribute are acknowledged within the front of the publication. Each publication has that. So if you want to see your name in light, I'd encourage you to uh, come along and uh, put your hand up uh, for our next set of publications. Emerging risk was interesting. For the first time, there are three publications around a particular topic. Previously, we've always done single publications, but the complexity of it and the newness, I guess, meant that we, we wanted to split it into these three, identify, tackle, and embed. And at the moment, we've issued identify and tackle, and embed is with the IRM, and the marketing team and the editorial team, and should come out shortly. Um, I think we had about 14 people um, from different organisations contributing to these. And if you look at things like setting risk appetite, you'll see different names coming through because I think people put their hands up when it's something either their organisation wants to tackle or they're kind of personally interested within the subject. So I think the final edition should be out in September or October, and we will do a full-blown session on them via a webinar, which you're very welcome to attend. What I'm gonna cover next is a fairly short um, section because obviously uh, we're limited for time. And interestingly, I've just realized I can't see time, so hopefully I won't overrun. Okay. So the first thing to say about emerging risks is how do you define them? It's always a good place to start, we think, um, and we ended up with seven characteristics that make up emerging risks and make them different to the more business as usual risks that we're all comfortable, that we know about and, and we can tackle. Uh, the seven are, and I am going to read these, uh, that emerging risks tend to be ambiguous, chaotic, complex, with a moving time horizon, uncertain, uncontrollable, and volatile. And on page seven of the guide, you'll see there's a full explanation as to what we mean by each of those words, because we felt it was important to be able to differentiate it. Emerging risks can appear uh, quickly, they can develop quickly, they can be totally unexpected or a bit of both. Um, some of the older people on the webinar might remember Y2K, which was going to be the end of the world in about 1998 and 1999. Um, but in the end, it didn't really happen. 
So that's what I mean by they may feature or they may just die away entirely. So the working group ended up with these three categories shown um, as categories of emerging risk. You could have a new risk in a known context, something you um, know that's coming down the road. So maybe an activity that you do that's going to be impacted by chain regulation. For example, there's a known risk in a new context. Um, an example of that could be if you're going to take on a new activity, maybe running a creche for children of employees and volunteers, which isn't directly connected to what you do. Maybe you're a mental health advocacy organisation, but you want to do that. That's a new risk, in a, sorry, a known risk in a new context and a new risk in a new context is a risk you've not even thought about before. Um, and although emerging risks can be put into the too difficult bucket as I've said there by their nature um, they are often high impact even if they're low frequency or might not even happen. Uh, they're difficult to pin down into how big they could be, um, what the impact could be for the individual organisation. And it's this difficulty that makes some people put their head in the sand, shrug their shoulders and give up. But we believe if you can start thinking about and having conversations about emerging risk within your organisation, your organisation is much more likely to be able to build and maintain resilience should the risks occur. Um, we think the conversation needs to involve the senior team, whatever that consists of. Um, but we do believe it should include the trustees, given that ultimately a lot of the time they have the responsibility to make a challenge and to take action. And we know some, board, some boards are already starting to make that challenge, just from the feedback from SIG members. There are others who it might be worth bringing into the conversation, maybe your peers who have started to tackle emerging risk, experts such as auditors, risk consultants, cyber specialists, climate change specialists, anyone you think might add useful insight to the discussion that you have on emerging risk. Um, and I would always say you may have the perfect people sitting out there in your volunteer, employee or professional advisor community. So don't just think external, sometimes it's internal and you don't even know they're there. Um, so once you've got the team together, the identification of emerging risks could be a request for people to look at various pieces of research, do some internet research, and just come to a meeting with some thoughts of their own to put into the mix. Within the guides on pages 11 and 13, we do run through some techniques that might help you make the most of the meeting by offering different ways of identifying emerging risks. The three on the slide may be familiar, or maybe the first two are familiar and the last one isn't. Um, but the, slide, the uh, guides do go through them, so I definitely suggest having a look there. PESEL works by thinking about risks in categories, and I, my brain operates that way, so it's ideal for me. PESEL being political, economic, social, technological, legal and environmental. And sometimes it's EL as opposed to LE, but that's what they generally mean. Um, in the guide, we uh, set out how to use the technique as well as what it is um, and, and who could use it. The SWOT is obviously strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And it's a good, straightforward, well-recognized technique that once you've got your pestle in order, can help you drill down into how the organisation is currently equipped to respond to the risks identified by PESEL and what opportunities there may be for improving 
um, how the organisation is equipped. Horizon scanning may be less well known, although there's a lot of chat about it on the internet. Um, we've defined it as, and I'm going to read this, a systematic examination of information to identify potential threats, risks, emerging issues and opportunity. It's kind of like a scientific crystal ball approach, in my opinion, that looks at individual risks identified, how they might turn out in the short term, the medium term and the longer term. And I'll definitely point you here to the IRM's Innovation 6 paper on horizon scanning um, and I think horizon planning, um, which goes into horizon scanning in much more detail than our publication, although we do point you in that direction. But a lot of the work here revolves around research and where to find insights. Um, I've always believed horizon scanning is a great concept, but it can be difficult for an organisation to tackle it single handedly because it can be a bit labour intensive. And when people are short on time, it can be the thing that they don't do. Um, so I'd ask you to think about setting up peer groups um, and collaborating and sharing resources and output generally. Um, so we all learn from each other within the sector. Unlike the construction se sector, I always feel the charity sector is more about learning from each other and sharing. Um, so I think this is a good opportunity to do just that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, Appendix 2 is a great place to go to within the guide for a starter for 10 when you're thinking about what risks could possibly be out there. And I've put a few of them um, on here. Um, and that appendix lists um, 11 to get you started by Dr. Keith Smith, who I've called here an eminent expert, which he is. Um, the IRM's Innovation 6 paper um, is also good and helpful. And the World Economic Forum's risk annual risk publication is another good place to look just to get some ideas and then think about, well, does AI, for example, really relate to what I do? Does retail do scarce resources? So it's a case of, it, it might give you a starter for 10 um, to get the gray cells going. Um, the second publication is about how to tackle emerging risks once you've identified them. Um, and we kind of summarized all the different techniques we could come up with into this arrow. Um, and you'll see that there's a scale here that goes from, if you wanted to take a simpler approach, you can use high, medium, low, you can use red, amber, green. Um, if you're a developing uh, organization, you're used to a five by five matrix um, as per ISO 31000 and our getting started publication, you may want to just stick with impact and likelihood. If you're more advanced, you might want to add proximity and velocity, by which I mean how close to your organization the emerging risk is, or how quickly it's um, coming at you. Um, on, if you're a mature organization, um, scenario planning is, is a bit of what if analysis, you know, what happens if an emerging risk X happens? What if the risk X happens and then another risk happens at the same time? What if the risk happens and then as a result, more risks hit um, and change everything? Um, and we use the pandemic as an example of where we started off with, gosh, how do we manage the virus? Then we moved on to what does the virus mean uh, for how society operates? then what is the economic impact of the pandemic? So the guide is there to give you uh, techniques, ideas on how to deploy them within your organizations. Um, and uh, lastly, the assured approach is around assurance, three lines of defense, if you like, or four lines of defense, and put the onus on managers to proactively inform senior management. Um, so that could be board reports, 
looking at outward facing policies affected by um, the emerging risks that you're considering, mapping the risk to the board agenda, etc. So that there's quite a lot there and I've gone for it quickly, but I, I think that's what I need to do. Um, the treating of emerging risks is uh, another potential tricky subject. I'd always start with the four T's, tolerate, treat, terminate, transfer, uh, because it's logical. Um, and we cover the detail of that in getting started. Um, and a bit, as you can see here, this bit lifted from uh, that particular guide. But when we were thinking about it and looking at specific examples, we realised quite quickly that this won't work for every emerging risk because of their unpredictability and the other seven features that we started out with. So as an alternative, it could be just a case of consistently and constantly monitoring how the risk develops for you and then modifying your plans and priorities to respond to that. The good thing is, at least if you've gone through the identification, you should have a good um, idea of the type of risks that are out there. And we're not saying you're going to identify every risk either, by the way. Um, the appendix to the second publication has a really good uh, example um, that was um, developed by the working group and which has a fictitious UK headquartered NGO who operates retail shops to generate income. Um, and it takes the scenario planning technique, um, it runs through four different scenarios and then shows the two that were selected to take forward to implement, monitor and continuously evaluate. So that is a real whistle stop tour of our two publications to date. I hope that wasn't too quick. Um, and I just wanted to move on changing the subject to Resilience Reimagined. Um, this is a fantastic publication. We were very lucky to have Rick and David um, do a presentation to us. They're both very much long into seasoned professionals. Rick works for Deloitte. Uh, David is um, a professor at Cranfield. Uh, with over 20 years experience um, and he's worked in industry as well and they came and spoke um, at a SIG webinar so the, um, the you can download this still uh, the webinar that is from our um, SIG page um, and I have to say when I read it I was absolutely stunned um, I, I think it's really clear practical easy to read, accessible, um, easily resonates. And I'll show you a couple of slides. Um, and basically it revolves around a lot of research that was done to identify seven resilience practices that mean you will survive and thrive um, risks. You will create a resilient organization. Um, and it delivers as well a, a practical model way of thinking about risk and um, moves on to something called adaptive leadership. So this is a rather busy image, but I've lifted it from uh, page 41, I think. Um, and these are the seven practices. Um, and uh, as you can see, it gives you a map to follow to get your organisation from A discuss future failure to be actually stress testing thresholds. Uh, this one is from page 44 and as you can see at the top leans on other research which you'd expect from an academic publication um, and this sets out the different levels of maturity around resilience that your organisation could reach if you so wished moving right from being a bit ad hoc about how you uh, control resilience and, and are resilient right up to generative. Um, and as I say, I think this is an absolute must read document. And it is really easy to read, although it sounds scary because I'm showing you page 44. Pages are easy to read. It's not text heavy. Um, there's a lot of visuals involved. 
um, and I think it's invaluable in helping any organisation um, become resilient. And the reason I've linked it to emerging risk is because I think that's probably a key part of managing emerging risks is making the organisation more resilient. Um, so thank you. I'm not sure how I've done time-wise, um, but um, we hope you decide to join the SEEK. You can do that via the IRM website, attend an event or two, possibly even step up and um, contribute towards future publications. Uh, we're thinking about uh, key topics um, of future publications within book quarter four. So by all, by all means, hop on the um, SIG webpage, you'll see our contact details there and let us know if you can think of any particular areas that your organisation is struggling with that you'd like us to tackle. So that's me done, Paula. So, Paula, sorry, done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. Um, so thank you, and I think that was a real um, kind of un it give gives everyone an understanding through through the last year we have been looking at trying to make sure that all the Scottish members really understand the resources, the the special interest groups. Uh, the committee the networking that is available for them um, and I think that, that that you've done that really well um, and that if anyone is listening that is interested in you know the kind of charities etc then that it's given you a really good forum and for the people on the line to know you know that that resilience and resilience reimagined I thought I'm going with that you know so it's this is yeah. this is one of the reasons why we do this yeah um, so thank you so much for that. Um, it's much appreciated. Uh, what I'm going to do is just take over now, um, just for the last slide. Um, this will be the only time I'm not able to do this. Okay, so Thanks for giving us the opportunity. No problem, no problem. So everyone should hopefully be able to see my screen now. Hopefully. I can see everyone's. So I just wanted to basically um, end the seminar by saying thank you for your support. Um, I put out a publication on the LinkedIn um, Scottish webpage uh, and on my LinkedIn page. I, I am stepping down as chair, so today I'm just making everyone aware of that. Um, we are looking for someone to, to take on the new chair, no one has been appointed yet. So, if there's anyone on the, the the event today that would like to, please contact the IRM or myself um, with showing your interest. Um, but today will be the last time that I will be will be running the the event. So, thank you for your support through the last few years. I hope that you've um, that you've had some presentations that have um, helped and been meaningful to you and grown your support. Um, for everyone on the call today, remember to stay connected. The IRM Scottish General Group here, as you can see, that is um, something that will know when events are coming up. And also the IRM Regional Group on the IRM web page. Um, if you, you need to register on the Scottish web page for the IRM to be able to to information about what what is happening and um, what's live, what's coming up. So, if you could if you could do that, just to make sure that you're not you're not getting missed, that would be greatly appreciated. So, thank you all for coming on today. I hope um, I've not got any questions that I can see um, or anything in the chat. So, I'm going to close now and thank you for for coming on. I hope it's it's um it's been helpful for you. Thank you, guys. Bye.